Good morning, people of God. We praise him for the privilege of singing. We praise him for the privilege of prayer and the privilege of being under his word, being instructed from his word. It is a great joy to be here, and I pray that that is filling your heart. And, and here's the thing, if it's not, and you know, sometimes we're, we're just sort of puttering along and uh, not doing so well mentally, Uh, ask the Lord, cry out to the Lord and say, God, help me to be present here. Help me to worship. Help me to learn and listen and think and uh, help me to hold my heart open to you so that you will do your work in me. He is gracious to us. I think sometimes we think we have to muster up everything on our own, but it is the Lord who disposes the heart. Uh, The hearts of mankind are in the hands of the Lord. And so pray to him. And ask him to give you the grace of worship. It has to come from him. It's from him and to him. It has to come from him anyway. And so let's take note of that and ask him this morning to prepare our hearts to enter into his presence. uh, And at this particular time in our service, into uh, his presence as we study his word. If you would go with me in your Bibles to Exodus 25, verses 10 to 22. Exodus 25, verses 10 to 22. To 22. Our time in Exodus has brought us to the tabernacle. Uh, Maybe that just went right over your head. You say, okay, I have no idea what that means. Uh, And maybe you have a lot of capital there to work with. You have a lot of background knowledge there on the tabernacle. This is the dwelling place of God among his people. We'll talk, we'll be talking about that from many different angles as we go forward. Uh, over the next several uh, weeks, months, but uh, we are now in the tabernacle. And so once again, we are in a series within a series. And I think, uh, you may not agree, but I think it's exciting that when we go through a book of the Bible, uh, we get to see uh, the, the book unfold. We get to see the meaning of the author very clearly because we go from section to section, from verse to paragraph to section. We move through the book. And so we get to see all these familiar passages in their context so that we have a firmer understanding of what they mean, what they're about. But another exciting aspect of it is that we get all of these little mini studies, these little mini series within. And so I can remember, for example, when we did the Sermon on the Mount and we got this little series within a series on prayer. Uh, The Ten Commandments was a series within a series. And now we're coming to something very similar as we look at the tabernacle. And what we find is that the tabernacle will actually dominate the rest of the book. So if you're over the tabernacle already, you're just going to be in bad shape (laughs) because we got a long way to go. So the better thing to do is just sort of strap in, get ready, and, and just say, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this on mentally, in my heart. I'm going to let the Lord work this over. This may be, as I said last week, a passage when you read the Bible, you just skim. This is a skimming portion, maybe, uh, you think. Uh, but we're not going to skim. So we are going to go through this. And I know that the Lord will use it in our lives. And the fact that this theme of the tabernacle dominates the end of the book. The rest of the book of Exodus will be centered on this. It tells us that the theme of worship will dominate the rest of the book, right? So if you get bored with the tabernacle, your mind should see worship. When you see that word that starts with a T, you should see the word that starts with a W. Tabernacle equals worship. And that tells us that the end of the book of Exodus is is not really about the tabernacle, it's about worship. And of course we know how central that is to all of our being and doing. The narrative of Exodus teaches us one important truth. And that is that we are redeemed, we are rescued, we are saved for worship. So that's one of the great implications of the narrative structure of the book of Exodus, the fact that you have this great Exodus event. It's an event of salvation. It's God's rescue of his people. But that's not the end in and of itself. That's not where the story ends. The story ends with worship. It ends with God's praises. And another way to say that is that Exodus is a God-centered book. 
It is God-centered, not man-centered or me-centered. And that's the problem with our thinking often, and we know that this is huge in our culture, is that everything is me-centered. And we drink this water and we don't even taste it. We don't even feel it going down. We breathe this air and we're not even cognizant of it. This is the culture we live and move and have our being in. It is me-centered. And what the Bible does is it entirely reorients our worldview. It tells us that all of reality, all of the Bible, everything God has done, is doing, and will do in our lives, in our church, anywhere, is about Him. It's about His glory. And we see this all over the Bible, but one of those great verses that just captures the mind and and puts this so clearly in view is Romans chapter 11. Verse 36, and you'll remember when we were going through Romans, we saw this in context, once again, in context and how it is rooted in a very specific context about what God is doing in salvation history. But the words themselves do serve well just hanging in the air. And this is what it says, for from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be glory forever. That's the theme of Exodus. That's the theme of the whole Bible, and that's the theme of each and every one of our Christian lives. So it forces us to take our minds off of ourselves, our own problems and ambitions and feelings and thoughts and all that stuff, and to put our thoughts on the Lord. You may remember that last week I made the point that we should avoid fanciful interpretations of the tabernacle, (coughs) ascribing special meaning to every little piece of construction and stretching the evidence to make these connections work. That does happen, by the way, among Christians. It happens in apologetics, where it's like, well, it it, it serves the greater good, the greater good of of sharing our faith. And so you just kind of, you kind of bend the evidence, you kind of you kind of force it. And one of the things my dad used to always tell me when I was a kid and I was trying to sort of fix things is don't force it. Don't force it. Because what happens when you force it? You break it. And so we often try to force things and we find all of these little meanings where they really are not meant to be that. And so we stretch the evidence to make these connections work. We don't need to do that. God is the God of truth. He's the God of evidence. He is the God of all reality. We don't need to stretch anything. We don't need to uh, find meaning, inventing it in our own minds without firm evidence. However, we also want to avoid undercutting the significance of what we find here in the tabernacle. So we want to avoid these fanciful interpretations but we also want to avoid undercutting. One way to say this is we want to avoid sort of the popular level pamphlet that can be sensationalistic with regard to these things. Ooh, look, you see that? That clasp, that ring, that's that's referring to Jesus' fill in the blank or whatever and all of this sort of stuff. We want to avoid that sensationalism, but we also don't want to avoid the, the skepticism of the academy. Right? So some commentators come in and say, there is no significance to any of this. This is just building. It's just what they had. Right? So we want to move between these two errors of sensationalism on the one hand and skepticism on the other. And with that being said, I appreciate the way that one commentator, John McKay, puts this in his commentary. Now, this is a little bit of a long quote. So bear with me, but I think it's just so well stated, and I want you to see his reasoning and the balance uh, that, that he has with this question. So here it is. The question may be posed, do all the items that are recorded have special significance? All the items in the tabernacle. Are some of them merely technical details of construction? Interpreters have varied widely in their understanding of this point. There are two main lines of thought that we must do justice to. One, the tabernacle was primarily intended to educate the Israelites. We must therefore always be conscious of what particular items would have meant to them. 
Two, the New Testament provides many clues as regards what certain items foreshadowed. We are therefore in the privileged position of looking back at the tabernacle and as well as seeing what was immediately perceptible to ancient Israel, we can also trace what was embodied there because it foreshadowed what would come true in the fullness of the times. We would not wish to go so far as to find spiritual significance in every item, but the fact that the structure had to be made precisely in accordance with the divine instructions gives good grounds for arguing that not all the details may be dismissed as incidental. And I think it's an understatement there intentionally, uh, that many of the details cannot be dismissed as incidental or, or merely there for their uh, description of the construction of the tabernacle. There, there's much meaning, there's much significance here, but we're not to sort of go looking under every little crack and at every little loop finding uh, these fanciful uh, significance and meaning that may come to our minds and that we may be just inventing out of midair. So I say that just to help guide us as we go through the tabernacle, because I don't know what you've read, I don't know what you've seen. You've probably seen both sides of that, fanciful, sensational, and skeptical, and the hope is that we will move between those. Last week, we were introduced to the tabernacle with God's two big instructions to Moses. In chapter 25, verses 1 to 9, God's two big instructions. Take a contribution and make a sanctuary. So that was our entryway into the tabernacle. The Israelites are to donate what they acquired when they plundered the Egyptians. And we talked a lot about that last week, how when God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, they had all of these things with them, all of this fine clothing and all of this, these precious metals and stones and so forth. And it is that gift from the Lord that had the purpose of building the tabernacle. They plundered the Egyptians, it says. They did not steal these things. They did not butcher the Egyptians. God worked in their hearts, the hearts of the Egyptians, so that they would give all of these things freely to the Israelites. And the Israelites are to make, they are to take a contribution and they are to make a dwelling place for Yahweh for their God, making it exactly as he has showed Moses on the mountain, as he has shown Moses on the mountain. So here's where we ended last week, verses 8 to 9. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so you shall make it. So the reason the tabernacle is about worship is because it is about God's presence. The tabernacle is the place where God dwells with his people. It is the place where God locates his glory for his people's adoration. And they are to make the tabernacle precisely as God revealed it on the mountain. The title for the sermon this morning is The Ark of the Covenant. Will asked me this morning... Uh, if I uh, was going to dress up as Indiana Jones today, and of course that's not happening. (laughs) So you may have all kinds of ideas in your head about the Ark of the Covenant uh, from the popular imagination, but it is one of the holiest objects, just from a a secular standpoint, uh, it's one of the holiest objects in the history of the world. Uh, An incredible uh, artifact, if it were found, an incredible piece of history just in its own right. But today we're going to talk about the Ark of the Covenant as Christians. We're going to talk about the Ark of the Covenant as, as those who are the heirs of all that we are reading here at Sinai. As we consider ourselves grafted into the people of God. Uh, one line of people who worship the true God going all the way back through the tabernacle, through Sinai, all the way back to righteous Abel. And for that matter, Adam and Eve themselves going all the way back. We are the people of God. So we look at this object not as a fascinating piece of history, not as a piece of the popular imagination, but as this great moment in the history of of redemption. We begin with the most important object and location of the tabernacle. We need to say that the, the, 
the Ark of the Covenant is an object and it is a location. It is both of those things. This is the heart and the epicenter of this, this holy dwelling place of the Lord. So if you would stand with me as we read God's word together. Going to read verses 10 to 22, Exodus 25. This is the word of the Lord. By the way, this is still uh, God, Yahweh, speaking to Moses in the glory cloud on the mountain. Verse 10. They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length. A cubit and a half its breadth. And a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and outside shall you overlay it. And you shall make on it a molding of gold around it. You shall cast four rings of gold for it. And put them on its four feet. Two rings on the one side of it. And two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood. And overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. You can go ahead and be seated. You see that um, we move out from that. From the most holy place in the tabernacle, we move out from that to the holy place. And that's where we'll get the table for bread and the golden lampstand, which we'll look at uh, in weeks to come. But for today, we get the most sacred object, the centerpiece of the tabernacle and the holy place, the most holy place, we get the Ark of the Covenant. So let's pray and ask for God's grace as we gather uh, around his word. Father, we're grateful for the scriptures. We're grateful for what we've already seen from the scriptures as we've sung your word and prayed your word and read your word as a church. Lord, now we come to look at it in more detail, to study it and to understand it for our own edification, for your glory. And God, we pray that you would help us now by your spirit, that you would illuminate your word, that you would help what, the, what is here to be clear, that the meaning of it would be clear and that you would use that to impact our hearts in very specific ways, ways that only your spirit can do. Father, we thank you that you are the God over all of our hearts. And we thank you for those of us who are Christians that you inhabit our hearts. You have written your law on our hearts and you have uh, come to dwell within us. Lord, what a mystery. Uh, What an extravagant, amazing, wonderful truth that you dwell within your people. Father, we praise you for this, and we thank you for how the tabernacle points us to Christ, to his atoning work, to your holiness, God, and to our sinfulness and our need for Christ, and how it points us to our ongoing relationship with you by the Spirit as we walk with you through this life, abiding in Christ, being in your presence. Lord, we thank you for all that the tabernacle means to us and for the fulfillment of it through the Lord Jesus. And we pray that you would guide our hearts and minds this morning to see clearly what's here and to desire to live it out and to go forward from this place to actually live it out. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name. 
Amen. So the ark is presented here as two things. It has two overarching functions. You try to simplify everything here. It has two, as it's presented here, it has two overarching functions. And so here they are on the screen. The chest of truth and the place of mercy. Uh, So for the kids, if you walk away from this sermon and you remember that, that's great. The Ark of the Covenant is the chest of truth and the place of mercy. Now that doesn't mean once you get those scribbled down, you can go on and, you know, just daydream. I'm just saying that that's fundamental. So keep that very much in view as you think about what this whole thing is called the Ark of the Covenant. The chest of truth, verses 10 to 16, the place of mercy, verses 17 to 22. So we're going to look first at the chest of truth, and as we do, we're going to go back to these verses 10 to 16 and look at them again. So let's read them together again. <clears throat> they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold inside and outside. You shall overlay it. And you shall make on it a molding of gold around it. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet. Two rings on the one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. As we find throughout the tabernacle section, these verses are filled with technical construction details. Now, as I was thinking about this, some of us within this church, certainly not me, um, are uh, are used to building things and fixing things. Maybe you even are a, you work in construction. Maybe you're a contractor, so you oversee various kinds of construction or the various component parts of a construction project. And so for you, this, uh, this is the, the kind of thing that you're going to be familiar with. And you probably will have a view on this, that, uh, an insight into this that others won't be able to have because you actually have built many things. You've seen how corners actually fit together and objects relate to other objects in proximity. This is technical construction detail. We get materials and measurements. It reads like an instruction manual because that's what it is. I mean, there's just no way around it. But we are reading an instructional manual. That's where we are at today in the life of our church, as we're going through Exodus, is we're, we're re- we're not, we have no desire to overlook this. We have no desire to fly past this to something better. We're, we're quite happy to, to camp here and, and to see what God has for us here in these instructions. God is telling Moses how this particular object is to be constructed. And he begins with definition and dimension. Definition and dimension. It is to be an ark of acacia wood. Now, ark here is an archaic English translation that has just stuck over the years. So no one really calls the ark of the covenant anything other than the ark. And that's because it has stuck for centuries uh, in translation. It is, uh, it is stuck for quite a long time as we think about what this object is. Is And it's not to be confused, in case you're wondering, with Noah's Ark. So it's a different Hebrew word. So don't think the Ark of the Covenant. Oh, Noah's Ark. Once again, you start drawing all those connections and those lines and all of this stuff, which is great. And we want to do that sort of thing as we read the Bible. But just so you know, those are two different words. Those are not the same thing. The Hebrew word means a box or a chest. Uh, That's all it is. It is a box or a chest. The only other occurrence of this Hebrew word before this point in, in the Bible, in the, uh, as we think about Genesis and then Exodus, the only other occurrence before this point is in Genesis chapter 50, verse, verse 26. And in Genesis 50, verse 26, we get Joseph's death. And this is what it says. So Joseph died 
being 110 years old, they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. So Joseph is put in a box. Coffin is the translation there because it's a box for a dead body. And here we get the very same word, a box or a chest, or as it is known to us, an ark. So in other words, the Ark of the Covenant is by definition a container. So it's the very first thing your mind needs to think when you think of the Ark, is it is a container. It is a container by definition. It is meant to contain something. And we'll come back to this in a moment. The dimensions are given in the standard ancient measurement of cubits. So this is something we encounter in the Bible a lot. You're left scratching your head. And typically, there will be a little note, unless it's like a reader's Bible where all those notes are removed. But typically, there will be a little note telling you what a cubit is in our own measurements. But this is the length between a man's elbow and the end of his middle finger. Now, we all know that men have different length arms and so forth, but uh, it's not far off when you talk about the elbow all the way to the tip of the middle finger. And the cubit was basically that distance. So you can imagine there is no measuring tape. People are out there, and they also measured often with palms. But you can think about something being measured from elbow to fingertip. That was a cubit. And it is approximately, and I say this, approximately 18 inches long. So this chest is to be, in our measurements, 45 inches or 3.75 feet long and 27 inches or 2.25 feet wide and tall. So let me just say this. This is not a very large rectangular object. It really isn't. I was, I was trying to do my little measurements, you know, uh, thinking about uh, where I was at the time when I was reading through this in detail and trying to sort of understand exactly how big this object is. But it is not a very large rectangular object. It is rather modest in size. And at this point, I'll go ahead and put up a picture of it. So you can see this is one rendition. And I, I think that there's a little bit of an issue with it, but we'll talk about that in a moment. But this is one rendition. And what I've done is just simply taken the picture from the ESV Study Bible, uh, a credible resource. And uh, as we used last week, the, the image of the tabernacle, uh, this is the image there of the Ark of the Covenant. The instructions then move from definition and dimension to building materials. And the big word here is gold. It's flashing everywhere, literally. And as we read this, it is flashing everywhere. This gold, there is gold everywhere we look. The ark itself is made of wood, acacia wood, but then the wood is enveloped with gold. It is overlaid with gold. And so we read this in verses 11 to 13. Just see how many times we see the word gold. You shall overlay it. With pure gold. Inside and outside you shall overlay it, and you shall make on it a molding of gold around it. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet. Two rings on the one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. So one way to put this is that, is that there is gold in it, on it, and around it. Gold around it in close proximity and then gold around it as you move out from it. It is surrounded by, enveloped by, dipped in, immersed in gold. But it's also interesting to note the distinction between the types of gold, and this is a subtle distinction, but we're meant to take note of it, we have pure gold where all of the impurities, even something as, as precious as silver, all of the impurities would be removed from this pure gold. And then we just have gold, pure gold and gold. And notice here that the ark itself is to be wrapped in pure gold or overlaid in pure gold. And we'll see this in a little bit with the lid as well. But the molding... The rings and the poles are simply gold. The ark itself, pure gold. And all of those other things, just gold. And the poles, of course, being made of wood and then overlaid with 
gold. So what's the effect? What's the point that I'm trying to make here as we see all of this gold? What's the effect that this is meant to have on the reader? And by the way, note, uh, take note of this. Very few people would have seen the ark uh, actually seen, laid their eyes on the ark. So as this is being read by the ancient Hebrews, as it is being read by us, what is the effect of all of this mention of gold and specifically of the ark itself being in pure gold? Well, the entire structure is to be set apart as holy, but the ark itself is particularly holy. That's the idea. And this makes sense when we see that the poles, which are to continually remain in the rings of the ark, would have been carried when the ark was moved. So as the ark is moved, the poles are to remain in those rings, as you saw there on the screen. And those poles are to constantly be there so that the ark can be carried. The poles were to be touched, but not the ark. We are probably also meant to understand that the rings were attached at the bottom on the feet of the ark. So if you could, Will, put that slide back up for us. The rendition here really doesn't have any feet at the bottom, and it's unclear exactly what this word is trans- should be, how this word should be translated, so uh, scholars debate that. But there's really no feet here on this thing, and the poles are attached on the side so that as it's being carried, the ark itself is not elevated all the way. It's probably the case that the rings were at the bottom, on the molding, and the poles would have run along the bottom. That way when the ark is picked up, all of the ark rises above those who are carrying it. The feet would have been part of the molding, and this kept the ark off the ground. It is not to be on the ground. And the ark would have been raised up as it was carried, as I said before. So the poles touch the hands, And the molding with rings touch the ground, but the ark is not to be touched. Let me say that again because this is important as we think about holiness. The poles are touched by human hands. The molding is touched by the ground, but the ark is not to be touched. And of course, we think about the story of Uzzah. We read this a little while ago in 2 Samuel chapter 6. I want to read to you again from verses 6 to 7. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it. Now, everything about this description in Exodus should tell any Hebrew, don't touch it. Don't touch the ark. The poles are to continually be there so that no one forgets. They're not to be sort of stored over on the side. And so they know, okay, step one, push the veil back. Step two, move over to the side. Step three, the poles Where where are the poles? No one's looking for the poles because they're not to touch the ark. But he put out his hand to the ark of God and he took hold of it. For the oxen stumbled. It's being transported on some cart, just bopping along. And Uzzah reaches out and touches it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of God. <clears throat> now we read a story like this and <clears throat> we think that just sounds harsh. It just sounds so harsh. And, and David even seems to think that it is harsh in the moment. It, it, it says that he's angry. So he's kind of got this sort of angry fear. You don't know what that, but we do actually know what that looks like in the heart. Uh, and so David's got this sort of angry fear. He doesn't understand, Lord, Why would you do that? The great theme here is holiness. God is holy. We get it in creation. And we get it as God comes to uh, Moses at the burning bush. And Moses has to take off his sandals for the ground upon which he stands is holy. God is holy. He's not to be trifled with. He's not to be treated lightly. He's not to be approached lightly and flippantly. God is a holy God. And his worship and his praises are not to be shared with the praises of false gods, the idols of this world. Everything about the tabernacle screams holiness, set-apartness, purity, perfection, and, and the gold 
reminds us of that. The no touching reminds us of that. Now we already know from the word itself that this object is meant to contain something. It is a chest, it is a box, it is a container. But we are not told what it is to contain until we get to verse 16. And you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. So what's God talking about here? The testimony that I shall give you. Well, we have to go back to his instructions to Moses in chapter 24, verse 12. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. These are the tablets of stone that will contain the Ten Commandments. God gave the law to his people audibly from Sinai. All the people heard God declare the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments. And now God is going to write with his own finger, however we're to understand that, God is going to write on the tablets of stone on the mountain and Moses is going to come down with those tablets of stone. We know he's going to throw them down because they're worshiping the golden calf. He's going to have to go back up there, get a new set. But the tablets are to go here. The ark, the chest, the box, the container, the sacred container will contain the Ten Commandments. These tablets are to be placed in the ark in perpetuity. They are to remain in the ark. They are a testimony or a witness of the covenant relationship and the terms of that covenant. This chest is to be a chest of truth. So if you're taking notes, and especially if you're, you're a kid and you're understanding what in the world the truth part is about, this is the reason for that. It is a, a chest, it is a container of God's truth, God's holy law, the terms of the covenant, the Ten Commandments inscribed on stone, placed into this chest. It reminds the people that God's presence with them depends upon his revelation. They are to hear him, know him, and obey him. Let me say this to us as we are here this morning worshiping. We worship in our private lives. We worship as families. We worship in our small groups. We worship, we know all of life is worship. Presenting our members to God. And we know that we gather on a morning like this to worship the Lord. But let me say this, all worship is built on adherence to the word of God. Where the word of God goes, by the side, worship cannot exist. At the center, see this, know this, let this burn into your mind. At the center of this worship, in this dwelling place, in this sacred box upon which God will dwell and manifest himself, at the center of this box, in this box, is the word of God. What Christian, what person can claim to worship God without his word? We can't just go along in our Christian lives and think that we are going to worship God with some sort of devotion and yet his word just lies by the side, just collecting dust, just ignored and neglected. As the Bible goes, So worship goes. All worship centers on this great reality. And so my plea with us is that we will consider how this should impact the way we see our Bibles. Think about that. This is the early Bible of the Israelites on stone in the ark. How does this impact the way we view those Bibles that we have lying around our house? How does, and I'm not talking about the physical object. I'm talking about the words within that book or on your phone. It's the words. It's the truth. See the placement of God's holy word in the tabernacle. So we see the chest of truth. And second, we see the place of mercy. <clears throat> For this, we're going to look at verses 17 to 22. So go with me there, please. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. 
Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work shall you make them. On the two ends of the mercy seat, make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. Just, just so much just exploding out of these words. Well, now we return again to definition, dimension, and materials. And I'll come back to definition in a moment. I want, I want to spend some time there at the end. But for now, we just need to see how this object physically relates to what we've just read. So right now in our minds, we've got uh, the, pitch, the picture aside, okay, so kind of unsee that. Right now, we've got just a box with poles. How does this object physically relate to that? And the simple answer is it's a lid. That's what we're getting described here in verses 17 and following. It is a lid, an object to be placed on top of the ark. As verse 22 says, you are to put it on top of the ark. So it is meant to be part of the ark. And and we we know this because uh, if, if we have anything, particularly kids understand this with their toys, if we have anything that's supposed to have a lid and you lose the lid, it's like, ugh. I don't even want this thing anymore. It's supposed to have a lid. And, and maybe you put it off to the side and, you know, you put some stuff in it. You kind of repurpose it. Moms are really good at doing that sort of thing. Uh, but for the most part, the lid is part of it. I mean, we understand the lid is part of it. And if it loses its lid, if it came with a lid, it needs to stay with a lid. That's part of this object. So, as a lid... It shares its dimensions with the box, as well as its materials. It is likewise to be made of pure gold. So we're not surprised there, just as the ark itself, and not the molding, molding is just gold, just gold. But the ark itself is pure gold, and now we see the lid put on top of it is also to be pure gold. But this object has one incredibly unique feature. This is no mere lid. It has angelic beings or cherubim on top of it, hammered out from the same piece of pure gold. They are to appear on each end, facing one another, and looking down at the lid itself. So, so they, are, they are turned, they're oriented towards one another, but their faces are pressed down towards the lid. They have wings and probably the body of a lion. And you get these uh, figures described in Ezekiel chapter 1. You see them in Revelation. Uh, the cherubim are all throughout Scripture. But these are zoomorphic kinds of creatures. They human face, but uh, an animal-like body. They have wings and a lion-like body. They're described in these various ways. And as one commentator put it, they could appear in different ways at different times. Their wings are to be stretched out overshadowing the object, okay? So we have this object in view. Now, we need to come back to definition. We've got the object. We know its basic purpose. It's a lid. But now we need to ask the question, what is this thing? What is the function of this lid? And why is it constructed in this way? And it is called here a mercy seat, This is a translation that has a long pedigree going all the way back to William Tyndale in English and Martin Luther in German. The word here is kaporeth. I don't like to throw around words, but I think it's probably important for this one. This is a biggie. It's kaporeth. And it is from the verb kafar. And it means to make atonement. The the verb in Hebrew kafar means to make atonement. Atonement, And here we have the noun form coming off of that verbal root to make atonement. 
So we could translate this word atonement place. This is the place where atonement is made, where reconciliation with God is achieved, and therefore where mercy is received. And so you see why for Luther and for Tyndale and others since this translation of mercy seat, seat there meaning a place, a location, where mercy seat has been retained. The idea is this is the atonement place, the place where reconciliation with God happens, the place where God's wrath against sin is appeased, the place where forgiveness occurs. This is the place where mercy is received, hence mercy seat. And we know that this atonement involves blood. And we're not surprised about that. We, we know of the Passover. We know as Moses comes down and he ratifies the covenant that he sprinkles the blood on all of the people. So it doesn't surprise us, although we don't read it in this passage, that blood and the mercy seat go together. Once a year, the high priest will enter the most holy place and sprinkle blood upon this mercy seat, this atonement place, and thereby secure atonement for the people. Appease God's wrath. Remove God's judgment on the people. Reconcile the people to God in relationship, in union, in love. Leviticus chapter 16, verses 15 to 16, describe this day of atonement. Then he, speaking of the high priest, shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil And do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. So I want you to think in this way, as as we think about the Passover, when God moves through Egypt and he sees the blood, He sees the blood and he passes over the sins of the people. That's a moment. That's an event. What we have here is a continuation of that event every year for the Israelites. As God will see the blood placed precisely in the way he prescribes it. He will see the blood of the sacrifice placed upon, the substitutionary sacrifice placed upon the mercy seat. And God will pass over the sins of Of the people. And as the place of atonement, it is also the place of meeting. And so we read in verse 22 There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat or the atonement place, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. This is the place where God will give more commandments in line with the commandments that are in the chest. And it is the place where God will meet with his people, commune with his people in relationship on account of the blood. As we finish this morning, and as we seek to understand the significance of the Ark of the Covenant for us, Christians here today, I want to look at a handful of major texts that I think offer keys to unlocking the significance of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I do have six of them, but they're not very long. So here we go. These are six texts that unlock for us the glory and the richness of the Ark of the Covenant. Not in an exhaustive way, but I think help us to really penetrate and understand what we're reading here. So first... Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Listen to these words. After the fall, it says that the Lord drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim. This is the very first occurrence of this word that we get in the Bible. And as we read, uh, notice when we're reading about the mercy seat, how many times these cherubim are mentioned. They're everywhere. They're they're, they're literally everywhere. And they were actually on the veil as well. They're, they're, They're everywhere in the instructions and they're everywhere visually as the high priest would carry out their work. He drove out the man 
And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, this is really wonderful. It tells us that what God is communicating to his people as they worship in the tabernacle is that God has made a way back to Eden. That God has made a way to go back. That uh, the toil and the pain and the suffering and the death and the separation of a fallen world, there is a way to go back. And so as the priest go back, They must pass between the cherubim or they must carry out their work between the cherubim there positioned at the garden of Eden. There is a way back to the tree of life. There is a way back to the presence of the Lord with whom they walked in the cool of day. And it is through God's redemptive work through the blood of his son So that's the first text, Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. A second important text is Psalm 80, verse 1. Psalm 80, verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. It's crying out to Yahweh. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. You who lead Joseph like a flock. You who are enthroned upon the cherubim. Shine forth. Now what in the world is that saying? That's saying that what we have going on in the most holy place is a picture of heaven. So not only is the worshiper brought back to Eden horizontally, historically, but the worshiper is brought vertically to heaven. All of this system, all of these objects, all of these furnishings, bringing the worshiper back to paradise, bringing the worshiper back to God's presence, bringing the worshiper ultimately to heaven, to the very throne room of the living God. That's what all these angels are meant to tell us, these cherubim. Third, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. It was revealed to them, speaking of those writing in the Old Testament, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And then here it is. Things into which angels long to look. Now that's amazing. Here we have these majestic beings. If we saw one of them, we would fall out. Just one. And here we are told that these majestic beings who, who exist in the presence of God, where God locates himself in heaven, once again, beyond our understanding, but where God locates himself in heaven, these created beings surround his throne night and day, crying out, holy, 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 and covering their faces. And these angelic beings here on the Ark of the Covenant looking down with this sense of awe because God is up there, but also with this sense of wonder, this sense of amazement, longing, looking, things into which angels long to look, knowing that this is just a picture, knowing of all the glory that God is doing to glorify himself And there they are looking down at the mercy seat. Fourth, Romans chapter 3, verses 23 to 25. I love verse 25, but I'm going to begin reading in verse 23. This is Paul uh, writing about the gospel. This is a a wonderful gospel passage, one of the most significant. Uh, When we were going through that in Romans, I believe I quoted Luther as saying that this is the most important paragraph in all of human writing. Well, part of it is here, verses 23 to 25. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And then here it is. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. A propitiation. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. What's my point with that verse? When the Hebrew Bible was translated 
centuries before Christ, there was a a, a well-known Greek translation called the Septuagint. And the word that is used here in Greek For this particular word, as I was talking about kaporeth, the word that is used here in the Greek translation of of this verse in Exodus is picked up by the Apostle Paul and used here in Romans chapter 3, verse 25, propitiation. And so we are meant to understand that God puts forward Christ as a propitiation by his blood or as the, the mercy place the atonement place, that Christ himself is the place where redemption is found. It's the place where forgiveness is found. It's the place where sins are put away and union with God occurs. He himself is that sacred place. And God accepted all those animal sacrifices for all those centuries looking forward to the propitiation of Christ on the cross. Blood of bulls and goats means nothing to the Lord. What is that? But the blood of his son means everything. And the God-man took our sin upon himself to remove our guilt and his blood stands forever. It is as he said on the cross, finished. And that brings us to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 to 12. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. There is a sense in which we could say that the tabernacle is blown apart for the Christian. Every obstacle to God's presence, every sin that weighs on us in our consciences and before the holy gaze of God is removed and the tabernacle is blown apart And we have absolutely free access to the Lord our God. This is what the tabernacle is telling us. Finally, sixth, we are the temple. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, we are a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. So let me say this. Here's here's the wonder that we need to leave with this morning, and it's this. We are living, breathing, moving arcs of God. And and you really have to see how it's constructed. You really have to see the care and the precious metal. You really have to see all that goes into it and the symbolism and the imagery to understand the gravity, which we still don't get, the gravity of what it means to say this morning that I am an ark of the living God. That as I move about, as I look at my computer screen, as I relate to my neighbor, as I raise my children, As I'm all alone by myself and no one's looking, I am an ark of the living God. And that just leads us to be holy in God's presence. To be grateful for the blood of the Lamb and to live the life that God has called us to live as his holy, blood-bought people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Ark of the Covenant. We thank you for all that it symbolizes and all that it was to Israel. Oh, what a grace, what a gift to Israel that they had a place where they could meet with you, the living God, and that you, in your grace, you made a way for them through these animal sacrifices, anticipating the sacrifice of Christ, you, in your divine forbearance, passed over those sins looking to Christ the true propitiation the true one who appeases your wrath against sin God we praise you for the Christian gospel we praise you for uh, all the richness of it and glory of it 
And we know, God, we will spend eternity praising you for its manifold glories. And we will never be able to exhaust its richness. We will never be able to praise you in heaven long enough to where we could sit down and say, I think all is said and all is done. Lord, we praise you for these realities. These realities, and we praise you, God, that they, they're not just things to marvel at. They're things that have become true to us in our lives, that you've saved us from sin. You've inhabited us. You've removed our guilt before your face through Christ. We praise you for that, Lord, and we pray that we would live in accordance with that great grace. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.